Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Lezak, Coordinator of Special Projects with the Adult Services Department. And on behalf of everyone at the Chicago Public Library, welcome. And happy National Poetry Month. Special thanks to CPL's Poetry Committee for their support of tonight's program. During the program, we invite you to leave your questions, comments, and reflections in the chat, and we'll ask some questions during the Q&A at the end of the conversation. Tonight, we're happy to honor National Poetry Month with a very special celebration of the 40th anniversary of Poetry East magazine. Founded in 1980, the internationally acclaimed literary magazine Poetry East is celebrating National Poetry Month in April with two milestones, its 40th anniversary and its 100th issue. In the notoriously fleeting world of poetry publications, where life expectancy is typically less than 10 years, the publication's record of sustained excellence is truly remarkable. More impressive still, Poetry East has been edited from the start by the noted poet Richard Jones, an English professor at DePaul University, where the magazine is based. Tonight, editor Richard Jones joins us in conversation with Miles Harvey, director of the DePaul Publishing Institute and author of The King of Confidence. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome Richard and Miles to the CPL virtual stage. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, and, and thanks not only to you, but to Leland, who's doing the sort of tech stuff tonight into the Poetry Committee, and just to CPL in general, such a, an important institution in our city, and I look forward to spending a lot more time at uh, the Harold Washington Library, for instance, in, in the coming weeks. Um, yeah, I just, it, want to, I just want to echo that and say, you know, it's so great not only to have the Chicago Public Library and Jennifer and Leland helping us this evening, but what a great thing to be able to put it on Zoom so that we can get even more people involved and, and invited into the conversation. So, so thanks for the technology as well. Yeah, so Richard, I'm yeah. so excited to be here. Uh, excited to be here with you, Miles. Yeah, we're going to talk about this amazing, quixotic, beautiful, time-consuming, soul-consuming, talent-consuming thing you've been doing for four decades. Absolutely amazing. But mm. I thought, since it's National Poetry Month, I just wanted to start by asking you the first time you were gobsmacked by a poem, that you were just knocked off your feet. You know, that's that's so funny you'd use that phrase because I was literally knocked off my feet. <laughs> uh, I, I remember it so vividly. I, I was walking along, I was in seventh grade and I was walking with my friend Bill also in seventh grade. And it was autumn and it was early dark and it was evening and the leaves had fallen. And he said to me, would you like to hear my haiku? And I said, your haiku? He said, yeah, I've written a haiku. Would you like to hear my haiku? I said, sure, let me, let me hear your haiku. And I remember it to this day, the haiku was, how strange for the trout soaring over the mountains in the hawk's talons. That's a great <laughs> just, haiku. That's a great, I mean, eat your heart out, Basho. That's just a terrific <laughs> haiku. And I literally kind of dramatically fell back into the leaves there on the lawn and, and just like looked up at the stars and the sky coming on and just said, if that's what poetry can do, then, I, then I've had my first introduction to it. So that was the, the entry drug, as, as that was they the say. Entry drug, that was, that was Perfect. And Perfect. how did the addiction take shape? The addiction took shape, I think, uh, you know, when I was young, I don't think I knew that poets actually existed, that there were poets in the world. It wasn't something that my family certainly knew nothing about, you know, literary life and, and that sort of thing. So I kind of thought that the poets were, were anachronistic and maybe even extinct like dinosaurs. Hmm. But but I was a writer as a young person. And the thing is, is that I always wrote, when I go back and I still have some of these uh, adolescent journals, I always wrote in lines. Mm -hmm. And so once I found poetry and realized, oh, poetry is also writing in lines. I'm writing in lines and put the line just became everything to me. So Hemingway said, you know, I'm gonna spend my life looking to write one true sentence and I've sort of been, I'm looking in my life to write one true line. Just the line became everything. And I started discovering all these poets and all the amazing uses of the line and the way the line can be 
displayed on the page and spoken out loud. Um, so yeah, the addiction came on pretty hard. And by the time I got to college and realized, oh my goodness, there are poets all around us. Um, I just started devouring everything I could get my hands on. And you went to University of Virginia, yes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and um, were you a, a poetry major there? I forgot. I was an English major and I, I really, I studied film actually um, a great deal, film and uh, a little bit of art. Um, but I was much more into literature. I wasn't so much a creative writer, though, though I did write and I took workshops, but really uh, I think it was film was the main thing that I was, was most interested in. And I know that even when I teach, I, I talk about uh, writing and creating very much in cinematic terms about edits and line breaks are like jump cuts and are we in a close-up shot or a wide angle shot. Um, so my undergraduate education was really, really important to me as a writer. Um, I learned a, a great deal that I've carried me to this day. Wow. And I, you know, your, your poetry is so beautifully visual itself. And I think about all the the great uh, visual poetry uh, in this magazine, Poetry yes. East. I, I want to yes. talk to you about how you got into this uh, line of work as an editor of this magazine. Can you give us an origin story of this magazine? Well, you know, one thing is uh, I, I, I thought, how am I going to become a poet? You know, how will I go about doing that? And today, I think most people, you know, turn to graduate school uh, programs, you know, rather quickly. And I thought of that as well, but I'd also wondered as a young person, how am I gonna make a living? And for a very brief time, I thought, well, maybe I could be a journalist and I could write book reviews. And I ended up reading and reviewing a book called The Little Magazine in America. And it pointed out that that was the way for many decades, this is back in 1978 or 79, I, I read this book, that for decades prior to that, poets had apprenticed themselves with, with magazines as editors and had learned their craft that way. And I thought, well, that's a, that's a really smart, great idea. I think, I'll, I think I'll do that. So a couple of years later, I found myself living in New York City and working in publishing. And I was the, the lowest person in the office uh, the lowest editor. I was a production editor, but that's where I learned how to make books. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll, I never, I have to tell you, I never dreamed I would do this for 40 years. And I certainly never dreamed I would <laughs> have the number 100 on an issue. But that, that book that I read said that the average lifespan of a little magazine was one and a half issues. Because you would, you would sort of throw your colors and give your manifesto and and the, would go out into the world and suddenly you would realize, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, feedback coming from what I've just done. So I thought, well, I'm gonna try and do 10 issues and that'll be a, a good apprenticeship. And then maybe I can go on and write my own poems from there. So what happened was, is, is I did my 10 issues and poetry to my delight just became something that I, I also became addicted to and loved doing and found that editing was a super creative act and one that I didn't want to give up. So I just kept on going. So, you know, you and I were talking earlier in the day and you used, uh, not surprisingly, a wonderful metaphor. Mm. You said a literary magazine, um, each really good literary magazine is like walking into someone's house. Oh, yes. And looking yes. around at their furniture and looking around at the books on their shelves. Yes. I wanted you to describe the Poetry East House, if you would. Yeah, you know, I think that's really true about magazines. You know, first, there, there's so many other magazines that I love and and that, you know, have influenced me and, and been a part of my life. Anya Review, Image. You know, here in Chicago, we have the amazing, astonishing, preeminent poetry magazine. Just wonderful uh, journals. But yeah, when you, when you come into a, a journal, it is sort of like coming into someone's home. You get a little... Uh, you, you get a sense of their, their artistic sensibility, you know, what they like, you know, what they consider a, a good feast. Um, so it really, it, it really is when you enter a journal, you're entering 
especially a journal that's done with, with one prim primary sensibility, um, which are the journals that I, I really, really uh, uh, admire and, and learn from quite often. Um, you do learn so much about uh, the sensibility behind the journal um, and it brings all this community in. And I think that one thing that you can do as an editor is you can bring lots of people into your home and introduce them one to another. And then you get conversations going and there's conversations going in one room over here and they're in a different language. And then there's conversations going over here and they're political and their conversations going over here and they're about aesthetics. And so I think that, you know, that notion of building a, a home for your poets is, is really, really crucial to me and something that I really strive to do. Well, and it's, um, I'm assuming for the poets who publish in that magazine, it's a welcoming home. I can say as someone who's had an office uh, very intentionally near you for my entire uh, decade at DePaul, um, it's just wonderful to see uh, your mentorship of uh, our DePaul students and just this community you've established at DePaul. But I wondered if you might talk about sort of what kind of poets, what kind, kind of poems and what kind of poets go in Poetry East. I mean, I think one of the defining characteristics is what we call plain language poetry, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And by that, I don't mean, just for anyone listening, um, poetry that is at all dumbed down. It's just the assumption, Richard, is that smart people who are fascinated by the world should be able to read smart poets who are fascinated by the world. I agree, I agree. First, I have to give a, a really heartfelt shout out to all my graduate students and my interns and to my students. Um, we love having you across the hall from us, but the poetry store is, is wide open and people come and go. And I'm so blessed to work with these super creative young people who, you know, sometimes I feel like their name should be on the journal, you know, as editor rather than mine, because they, they bring so much great energy to it. But they also help me in terms of thinking about poetry. Um, yeah, I think plain spoken is a, is a good way to, to say it. And simply what I would mean by that is that the poem um, has a certain accessibility. And as you say, that's, that's not being simple or, or unadorned or unwriterly or, or unconscious, but it's simply something that, that is not intentionally obtuse or intentionally you know, mysterious, but it's something that we can start to grapple with on first read. And there's something more than just being accessible. There's something that feels urgent about it. Like the message that's coming is necessary. Like when we read the poem, we can read it. I hope on the hundredth read, it's even, it's even better and even deeper and more resonant than on the first or second read. But on those first reads, there's something that feels so necessary, so vital, so deeply human that we just, we just want to read that poem again and again. And then I really love poems that are so wonderful in that particular way that you know that you can immediately share it with your friend sitting next to you. You can just say, look, I just read this amazing poem. You've got to read it too. So I love that notion that the poetry is a gift. When I, when I get these poems that come in the mail and I read them and they, they just blow my socks off, it's just amazing. I feel, you know, the hairs on my neck getting all, all standing up and goosebumps on my arms. I just immediately want to share it with people. And that's something that I think is, is unique. It's a certain kind of poem that can do that. There, there are other poems that I really love, you know, that, that take longer to kind of wade into the deep end. But I love those poems that can grab you immediately. There's something in the voice of these poems that's so human, that's so dynamic, that they're irresistible. They're just irresistible. Yeah, I have a quick story. Uh, right before I was coming down here, I, my 23-year-old daughter was upstairs and I said, oh, I'm doing an event for Poetry East. And she's a wonderful person, but she's not a big poetry fan. She said, I love that journal. I said, how do you know that journal? She said, Dad, I read that journal all the time. You leave all these copies in the bathroom. You leave them lying around the house. And so I think that that just speaks to Poetry East. You know, the other thing I love about Poetry East, of the many things, is 
the range of po poets in there. And we're gonna talk yes. about that, I think later tonight, but just international poets, a lot of American poets. I mean, how did it, a lot of poetry in translation, you do a fair amount of translation yourself. Right. Tell, tell me about that kind of range. I, I think that speaks to the fact that this, this kind of poetry that we're talking about, this, this sense of poetry being urgent and vital and necessary is not an American poetic, um, but it's international. It, and it also, more than that, it spans centuries, I think, and spans cultures. So for me, poetry always opens me up and makes me a little bit, a little bit bigger. It makes me more empathic. Um, it makes me, it makes me a little wiser. I find out things that I didn't know. I, maybe sometimes I knew them, but I didn't know I knew them until I read the poem. Um, so I think that range of poets that you're talking about, you know, I've published, you know, all sorts of people from, from Polish poets, Spanish poets, Chinese poets, Japanese poets, English poets, as well as, you know, all of our great contemporary American poetry but that there is this kind of conversation, one poet to the other, you know, that we, we're willing to speak and, and give that person a little bit of silence so they can speak into it, we can listen to them, and then we can turn our head and hear the next poet. And that they, they start building one upon the other. And so that range, I think, is something that I, I really look for to show that there's a range of human possibility, of human experience, of human emotions, of human passions that we share and that that's, it's our common ground, our common bond. You know, I love to the, a, a different kind of range in the magazine. There are some of regularly, some of the great contemporary poets working in the world, mm -hmm. you know, in this issue, which is, it's just a, an all-star team. Um, uh, but um, there's also, uh, some really unknown poets in this yeah. magazine. And sometimes from DePaul, I remember one, um, I got really jazzed about a poem in one issue. And I, I, the writer, I kept saying, where do I know her name from? And I'm thinking, maybe I read her in Poetry Magazine. And I, I looked to the back, I said, oh, this is a grad student. I know her at DePaul. And I, I was just blown away. And I wrote her just this fan note saying, I gotta tell you, like that just, kick my butt that poem. I'm just loving it. And, you know, I, I love that sort of range too. Can you talk about careers you've helped build or, or how, you, how you approach that? Yeah, well, it's, it's so, you know, it, it's just really nice because I have a lot of ways that I can be of service. Um, and one, one, for instance, is as a teacher, um, you get to, to share what you know and to bring in these poets. I bring poetry East into the classroom and I say, hey, let's read these poems. And the students are like, great, this is terrific. Um, but it's so amazing to me when I teach these workshops to see our DePaul students or when, I, when I've taught other places to see how extraordinary their poems are. And they too can write this immediate, accessible, clear, clearly spoken poem that gives us such clarity. So poetry is a, a way of seeing, a way of seeing. And so whenever I find a poet and especially new poets that I've not heard of before and quite often the cover letter will say that this is my first time I've ever sent poems out. And I'll just go, well, you need to be in the conversation here. So let's bring you into the mix because they're giving us a way of seeing. Poetry is so much about a way of looking at the world. You, you talked earlier about the visual arts and, and painting, um, film and cinema. Um, in the same way, poetry is trying to get us to see, to, to be clear. And I think that the, the more poets that I can bring in on board that, that can do that, the better. And then you don't have to wait until late career or until fame to find that kind of poet. Um, they're all over the place. Well, well, let's let's talk about that way of seeing, Richard. I was I was hoping you might read a few poems sure. from this wonderful um, anniversary issue, um, and then we sure. might, you know, then we can talk about them too. Um, sure, I'll, I'll start with a poem that's, you know, we we're we're all coming off this year of COVID that's been um, 
just so difficult on everybody. We've been we've been isolated. We've been alienated. You know, we've we've gotten together via Zoom. Thank God for Zoom. Um, but I think sometimes it's nice to have a poem that's just about happiness, which is what this poem's about. Happiness is one of those things that is is so hard to find and so hard to to grasp. And that's what this poem is about. It's called Coconut. It's by a poet named Paul Hostovsky. Coconut. Bear with me. I want to tell you something about happiness. It's hard to get at, but the thing is, I wasn't looking. I was looking somewhere else when my son found it in the fruit section and came running, holding it out in his small hands, asking me what it was and could we keep it? It only costs 99 cents hairy and brown, hard as a rock, and something swishing around inside. And what on earth? And where on earth? And this was happiness. This little ball of interest beating inside his chest. This interestedness beaming out from his face, pleading happiness. And because I wasn't happy, I said to put it back. Because I didn't want it. Because we didn't need it. And because he was happy, he started to cry right there in aisle five. So when we got home, we put it in the middle of the kitchen table and sat on either side of it, and began to consider how to get inside of it. You know, it's, it's such a beautiful poem. And it, when I was listening to, listening to you read it this time, it sort of reminded me about the, the coconut being a stand-in for a poem. Yes, right? like this thing that is useless. We don't need it, but we Absolutely. need it so badly. It's it's clearly about poetry as much as it's about the coconut. Absolutely, one hundred percent. You know, T. S. Eliot always talked about the objective correlatives. He'll say, he said, we'll find out in the world something like a coconut that will stand for our inability to get inside, to get inside it, to get inside happiness, to really embrace it and own it. Um, I love that poem. And that's, I think, a really good example of, of a poem that has great clarity. It's clearly spoken. And yet I could read it two or three, I'm not going to, but I could read it two or three more times and we'd go deeper with each reading. And we'd feel the, the psychology between the father and son a little more with each reading. And we'd feel how it is about poetry a little bit more with each reading. And eventually we'd feel something about happiness which is so abstract, such an abstract concept. And even one that the, the poet says, I, I wasn't interested in that. I didn't want that. You know, we're even sometimes almost as adults afraid of happiness or retrieve something of, of childhood. So it's a wonderfully complex and beautiful poem that, that does so much in such simple, straightforward language. The voice of the poet so clear. I, I just love it. Does it just reminds me of again like what you've done for four decades, Richard? I mean, here's this thing that's um, it's um, not something any capitalist system needs, and yet it's so essential to what you and I do. I think one thing people don't understand about our business is how vital these literary magazines are. Oh yeah, it's the way you build your career as a writer uh, are oh, yeah. in these small literary magazines that barely anyone reads except for, uh, you know, people who read a lot and those include editors uh, at book publishing houses, et cetera. So it's, it's just such an important thing. And I gotta say, um, it's also just such a source of joy, right? I, I really, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, poetry magazines are like having friends, um, you know, or, 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 or getting together with a group of friends. Maybe it's more like that. Um, they really are so important. They're really the backbone of American literature. Everyone who we think of as, as sort of bright stars of literature all began almost to a person in a little magazine somewhere um, that was read by you know two or 300 people maybe. So that, that the magazine has that kind of staying power um, that kind of, of uh, permanence, it's, you know, William Carlos Williams famously said, you know, poetry is the news that stays news. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you go back and 
I always love finding really old copies of, of almost any journal. So it'll be from, you know, the, the October of, of 1990. And I, I go back and I realize, wow, everything in here is really standing the test of time. Well, speaking of news, will you read us some more from your amazing sure. newspaper? I'll read, I'll read one um, from, you were talking about graduate students. I'll read one that came from uh, one of the graduate students that actually worked on the, the journal. It's by a poet named Nick Bruno. And it's just a lovely little poem called Rolling into August at Sundown. Rolling into August at Sundown. The front bicycle tire goes flat again. And with it goes me and my little niece to the village gas station. I cradle her small bicycle against my ribs as she bounces and skips alongside me at my hips. She wants to know how much longer I'll live and what I think of the color blue, both topics I already think about often. I know we can refill this tire only so many more times until it stops holding air altogether. Soon, we'll have to buy my niece another tire, but tonight, I don't mind our ritual. I've actually come to look forward to our gentle walk together up the village hill, always just after dinner, when the tall street lamps don't yet make light and the moon drifts behind warm trees. Wow, that's absolutely wonderful. And um, there's a kind of love in that that I, I know um, because I know Nick and I know yes. how closely you guys work together at the magazine. And I, 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 I know that you mentored him the way he mentored or the speaker of the poem mentored his niece. Yes, and I think you're right. I think it is ultimately a love poem. And, you know, love poems aren't just between, you know, the, the usual suspects. Here, I love that it's between the, the, the uncle and the niece and with that poor, pathetic little bicycle between the two of them and her skipping along and wanting to know how long he'll live. It's just, it's, it's so realistic. It's so present. Um, but to capture a poem like that, I think takes really uh, an extraordinary mindfulness to capture that in lines, to express the, the, just the, the, the joy and the fleetingness of that evening moment, walking down to the village to put air in the tire one more time. It's just a little, like he says, it's a little ritual. It's one of those rituals we go through and we do them with other people. And ultimately, I think you're right. Like coconut is about poetry and about happiness rolling into August at sundown. It's a, it's a little love poem. Um, it's a beautiful uh, sense of agape love, of, of giving love, of generous love. Um, and I, I'm so impressed by it. Would you like to hear another one? Yeah. I'm gonna read, uh, I'll read a poem, let's see. I'll read a poem called First Song. Because I know that a lot of the people who are tuning in tonight are, are poets themselves. And so this is for everyone out in the audience because we're all writers and we work on our writing and writing is such a solitary, um, sometimes lonely experience. So this poem is called First Song and it's by a poet named Matthew Murray. So Matthew Murray's First Song. There is a bird that started singing at five in the morning, in the dark, at five in the morning, just as I started writing. That's how I know it's spring, that I should keep writing, that the darkness has not swallowed us, and that there will be morning and noon and evening, a whole flock of hours. Although at this moment in the dark, there is just this one bird and no one who can tell me its true name or why it is out there alone and singing. So beautiful, such a beautiful poem about faith among other things. But yes. I, I, 
love that line that Schilling final, final it's in the near the end of, about no one can tell me its true name and it seems to me that that's such a such an attempt in poetry is to is to name the unnameable right or to, yes. or, or to at least um, try to find a way to express the unnameable yes uh, we, we talk about it all the time Donald Hall famously called it the unsayable said poetry is the unsayable said um, it's the inexpressible that gets expressed. It's the abstract emotion that becomes clear before our eyes. So we're always looking for that, that true name. And you know, one of the, one of the names for poet is the, is the one who names things. The poet is the one who names things, right? So we're always looking for the true name and every writer is always looking for the right word. But there is a part of us nonetheless that, that understands the mystery of what we're doing. You know, we're, we're, we're sitting in silence. We're, we're bringing words out into that silence. We know that we're gonna share them. Um, the, the poet sits down to write. You can hear the poet's consciousness so richly, so purely. And yet the bird just quite naturally is out there singing w without, a, without a thought, just, just, just so naturally. And so there's this kind of unspoken tension between the two between writing a poem and the bird that can just naturally sing. You know, don't, don't, wouldn't it be wonderful if all of us just could just naturally sing? <laughs> that yes. would be so extraordinary. It would, sure would be, uh, says the tone deaf person. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was wondering, I, I wanna make sure we have a, a little bit of time to read some of your poetry, but do you have another short poem for us from the, the issue? Yeah. Um, let's see, I'm gonna read one called, uh, See, I just read one about birds. Um, I must, as an editor, you know, sometimes I, I, I will put together a magazine. And one time I put together a magazine, this is many years ago. And a friend came to me and said, so this is your sports issue. And I said, what, what are you talking about? He said, well, this is clearly your sports issue. I went, I, I'm not following. He said, well, you had baseball, you had tennis, you had volleyball, you had track. You know, sometimes you're not even, a, fully aware of the connections that, that are made. Um, but here's one, here's a second poem about birds. This is called Abundance to Share with the Birds. And I'll tell you, I'll give you a, a, a spoiler. The poem is about a mother combing her daughter's hair. That's, it's just that moment that gets captured. And, and that's such a beautiful moment that I love with this poet whose name is Andrea Potos. Um, I love what Andrea has done with this, with this moment. It's called Abundance to Share with the Birds. Another early morning in front of the bathroom mirror, my daughter making faces at herself while I pulled back her long brown hair, gathering the breadth and shine in my hands, brushing and smoothing before weaving the braid she will wear to school for the day. Afterwards, stray strands nestle in the brush, and because nothing of beauty is ever wasted, I pull them out, stand on the front porch, and let them fly. Wonderful. Beautiful. What do you poem. love about that poem? I, I love the quietness of it. I love the, the fact that you can take something as simple as a brush stroke of your daughter's hair and say nothing of beauty is ever wasted and to take those those strands out of the brush and give them to the birds to make their nests just all the connections that are made the daughter who who is grimacing through the whole event and is going to go to school for the day the mother who stays behind um, I love these poems for all the emotions that they bring to bear without naming them and they trust the reader to, to be quiet and to be attentive and to listen and to take it in and to stand on the porch with the mother and, and let those strands of her daughter's hair fly into the wind for the birds to make their nests. Just, just a lovely poem. And who would think of that? And I don't know that it could quite be made into a film. I don't know that it could quite be made into a painting. I don't know that it could quite be made into a dance or a song. It's pure poetry. It's just pure poetry.
Hey, uh, speaking of things of beauty uh, that shouldn't be wasted, I would like you to read a couple of your poems. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, here's his two latest books. Um, well, you can see that I've marked <laughs> many places in Avalon and Paris I haven't read yet, but Richard is among other things, a stunningly prolific and gifted poet. And I, I don't think we should let this night go by without a couple of poems from him. I'll read you two. Um, you know, I've, I've just come off a very prolific period where uh, I've written and published a couple of books in, in quick succession. And that's really unusual for me. I'm, I'm usually a very, I'm a very conscientious writer and I'm disciplined, but I'm, I'm slow. So to have things come out kind of one on top of the other is, is unusual for me. And when the books came out, um, there's always a sense of, of myself being sort of set free. Like once you're done with a book, then, then what do you do? So this is a poem about um, having just finished a book. It's called Socks. After many long years, I finally finished the book I was writing. I wondered what to do next. My whole day ahead of me, I decided to tidy the sock drawer, an impossible jumble of lone survivors and mismatched pairs. I pulled the big drawer out and emptied onto the bed a small mountain of socks. I began to arrange by color the red ones I bought in Rome at Gamarelli's, the pink ones found in the Paris street market. I began lining up all my socks, much as I do with my poems, and tenderly folding them one on top of the other in pairs. I scolded myself for neglecting just how important socks are to a poet walking the path, how necessary to cushion and adorn the two feet that carry the heart up and down the ladders of heaven. Slowly, I lined the waiting drawer like a rainbow from yellow to purple, noting the black socks ran on and on like an ellipsis. Then I put the drawer back. It was only noon. The room was bright. All morning, I'd worked in my bare feet, and now my feet were cold. I wanted to lie on the bed and daydream, but not before I thought to put on a fresh pair of soft white socks, warm white socks with soles so pristine and unsullied, it was as though they had never been anywhere. I love the way socks become the poem in that. I'll read you one more. Great. So this is from Avalon, which uh, that last one was from a book called Stranger on Earth, which came out from Copper Canyon Press, who I have to give a shout out to them. They've been, you know, supporting me for, for many decades, and I, I love, love them very much. And this is a book called Avalon, which is from a, a small press here in the Midwest called Green Linden. And I really love working with them. They've been so great. Christopher Nelson is the editor there. So this is the first poem in the book and it's called On Living. On Living. First, you must suffer for a thousand years. Then you must renounce suffering and dedicate yourself to joy. Your hands empty, wanting nothing. You will wander in a forest of silence. And when at last you speak, your first word will be yes, or grasshopper. You will learn to tread on high towering clouds and to fall simple as a stone, to plummet and tumble straight down. On your knees with a wire brush, you will scrub the marble floor of the world and at day's end, wash your cracked hands at a wooden trough. Though all is waste and desolation, the moon will rise from desert sands and cast light and shadow on your old draft horse, your painted wagon and black tent with its wool blankets. When the hour's late and nothing more can be done, treasure the stillness and peace of the firelight and sing your song. So wonderful. Thanks. Um, well, if we have time, I wanna to talk to you about what songs 
come next in your repertoire? Oh my goodness, that's that's a great. We'll all have to hold our breath and see on that one. Yeah, um, I'd like to read a couple um, from Poetry East if we have time. Should we take some questions first? And, and sure, sure. I, I think I think just if we're going to fit those in, we should we should we should try to. That sounds um, great. Yeah, let's see where we go with that. Yeah, Jennifer. Okay, great. Yeah, we got some great uh, questions. Also, we have uh, viewers from all over, including a viewer who says hello from Mexico. So. Oh my goodness. Um, uh, you asked, how does your editorial work inform your own writing and vice versa? That's a great question. And it, it does so in a really profound way. And for the person asking this question, I would, I would suggest that you don't have to be an editor to, to benefit from what I'm about to say. You know, when I am in the office, I'll, I get literally boxes of mail and I have to go through these poems and figure out which one will I keep for the journal. And so there's so many questions that I have to ask, you know, what is the poem doing? What's it about? What's its narrative? What are its politics? What is its spirituality? What are, what are its ethics? There's so many questions to ask and so many craft questions so that when I'm spent you know, a day or a month or, or six months putting together an issue of the journal, it's very hard when I go to my own points not to ask the same questions uh, and to make sure that I'm answering all those questions. You know, do I have my narrative clear? You know, are my lines running true and smooth? You know, is the, the point of the poem without, you know, beating it with a hammer, you know, is the poem coming through? Does it have music? Is it a musical piece? Um, I love music. So one thing I think is when I read other people's poems, they sometimes wake me up to things that I need to remember and need to do in my own poems and then do. So all we need to do is, is read really great poems and say, I want to do that too. That's great advice. Um, our next question is also a question about advice. Uh, do you have any advice for a poet or aspiring writer hoping to get published? I, absolutely. Um, one is, and I don't know if this will sound good or bad to your ears, but one is to take your time, not to worry, um, and to trust that, that when the poems are ready or when the story is ready or when the novel is ready, it will find its publisher and it will find its readers. Um, I've found over the years in writing my own poems, all the way back to the very beginning, that time has always been an ally. And that's very interesting because I can be very impatient and want to hurry up and, and get my poems into the world. And it's always good to just give them a little extra time. Um, the other thing I would recommend to someone who's, who's starting out is to find a couple of like-minded people to read work with. You read their work, they'll read your work and trust that if they're smart and intelligent and have good common sense, that they can help you with your, your writing. Um, I don't believe that writing needs to be done by experts um, or professionals. I think writing is done by people and people who get together with other people can, can be of great service to one another. So I think getting in a small writing group is a, a great way to, to move yourself along and to get feedback. That's great. Uh, this question is for both of you. What do you both do when you get stuck? I'll let Miles go first. Well, the reason Richard's going to let me get, go first is because he is uh, he's going to give you an answer that will um, bother you, dear reader. Um, so because uh, <laughs> uh, I've heard him answer this question before uh, about writer's block. Um, so I uh, Richard, why don't you handle writer's block? When you well, get terrible writer's block and don't know what to write, what well, do you do? All I, all I would say is that I don't know that I really believe in writer's block. Um, and that's, the, that's the terrible answer. Um, I believe that we can you know, be fearful of sitting down to write. I believe that we can be distracted, um, but I don't think it's a matter of, of something called writer's block or, or getting stuck. I think if you're stuck, um, get up from your chair, take a walk around the room, drink a glass of water, come back and start again. Um, think of musicians. If, musicians rarely in the middle of a tune 
though they might get stuck or not know quite what to do next, they'll simply talk for a moment and start back up again. So I think that notion of, of starting again and again and again is very natural to, to all artists and, and all creative people. Actors will say a line one way and the director will say, stop, hold it. I'd like you to try it this other way. Try it in an ironic voice or in an angry voice or in a whisper and the actor will try it again. So I think getting stuck is simply a matter of opportunity. It's a matter of saying, okay, I'm stuck with what I'm doing right here, but maybe there's a chance to do it a different way and to try it again. So just to, to never, you don't lose hope, <laughs> don't lose hope. Um, hope's important, hope's that thing with feathers as, as uh, Emily said, you know, we, no. wanna, we wanna keep going. I, I, you know, I, I think I don't disagree with, with Richard about that at all. And I would say, um, I, I definitely feel like you just got to keep coming back. I mean, and to, to, your, to your previous um, uh, person who asked a question, I mean, you got to do the work and, and work involves just sitting there. And I think one of the things that the dirty little secret about writing, at least for me, is that massive percentages of it are boring. And I do not mean kind of boring. I mean, boring and tedious. And especially I'm a particularly slow writer. So I have to spend a lot of time staring at a screen, thinking about a sentence or series of sentences. And the only time I really love, love, love writing in the way that you see on movies when people are just typing furiously is uh, on revision. And so I think what some people call stuck is just what happens when you're trying to work through an idea and, and it's not fun and it can be not fun for a matter of days or more. And then you might end up throwing out, you know, hundreds of pages of what you just did. You so. know, the, the other thing I would say to our, our friend is uh, if you're stuck in your writing, just use your speaking voice, just, just talk. Um, Miles is the author, as we all know, of, of an amazing book called King of Confidence. And one thing that astonishes me is what, how much information Miles gets on a given page. But I can hear Miles's voice. I hear his voice. So to our reader who is stuck in the writing, just sit back and tell your story to the air or tell it to your friend or tell it to your mother, whoever you tell it to someone, because there's a story that needs to be told. And if you're stuck in some place, you're stuck in just some small detail. So don't let that little tiny rut ruin the whole big narrative. The narratives are larger than we are. They're, they're larger than our, our getting stuck. And they want to be told. They want to be expressed. And I would add, as, a, as someone who goes into the rut a lot, I just think sometimes you need to go into the rut and, and be there in the rut for a really yes. long time. And then yes. just, you know, to get out of it there's no like imagining your way out of it you're in it just be there and yeah. enjoy. you know the last thing is you know every poem that, that gets written isn't a great poem i've written many more poems than i've published and those ones that i have stuck in my several bottom drawers of the desk now you know don't need to see the light of day but it's practice you know we, we want to be able to practice musicians get to practice they practice all day long before they give a concert Actors rehearse for months before the, before the curtain goes up. So don't think of it as being stuck, but think of it as an opportunity to practice, to practice your craft, practice your art. And just, again, sp just speak out loud what it is you want to say. And that's going to that's gonna spur on the writing and set a fire under you, I promise. So I know we want to get back to a couple more poems before we close. So I'll ask one last question, which maybe won't be a surprise. Uh, people are wondering, where do you both teach? What classes do you teach and how can they enroll in one of your classes? So go ahead All and plug right. the ball. Now <laughs> we are talking. Um, so we teach at this wonderful, in this wonderful creative writing program at DePaul University. And Jennifer, I have to tell you, one of the cool things about a writing program is just the hands-on experience. It's called, we, we, we call it a writing and publishing program. And so um, we, I just, uh, and I'm not just saying this, like uh, uh, I gotta say scholars don't always say this about their colleagues. I, I love my colleagues in the English department at DePaul University. And I think we have this amazing 
thing going. Um, I'm the new director of something called the DePaul Publishing Institute. And um, we try to give students like this hands-on experience. We have these great publications they can do it in. Poetry East is one. Big Shoulders Books, this nonprofit publisher. Crook and Folly is a great student literary magazine. We have this thing called the DePaul Blue Book, which is a best of high school writing. And finally, and I wanna talk about this in a minute, we have this great um, nonfiction magazine uh, by, edited by this wonderful essayist and uh, nonfiction writer, memoirist, uh, Barry Jean Borich called Slag Glass City. So DePaul Magazine is the place you want to get in touch with. Richard? Yeah, no, I would just, I would just say, you know, we have a terrific group of, uh, 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 of writers. We have a wonderful community. Um, we're very open. Uh, we like people to come and, and, and share our classrooms with us. So um, you are invited if you want to take classes with us. Absolutely. Um, Miles is a terrific teacher of nonfiction, memoir, um, fiction classes, I think, on occasion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I teach, uh, I'm a poet, so everything, everything comes out, you know, with a poetry bent. But uh, I, I most definitely like teaching uh, prose poems and flash fiction as well. So, and we have, and as Miles said, we have just a terrific group of writers at DePaul. Um, so there's, it's not just me and Miles, there's, there's a whole bunch of people there that are really, really gifted teachers. Yeah, and, and gifted writers. Richard, can we um, uh, get to, I think we have time for maybe three more poems, Jennifer? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so Richard, maybe one more. Um, and then I, there is one we talked about. So I, I, I wanna talk, I, there's two I wanna hear. But, but first, anything you got from the book. But, but I wanted to talk about your sonnet at the end of the book and, and uh, the, other, the other poem we talked about. Uh, uh, so, Are you talking about the poem now? Now, absolutely. Yeah, we'll look at that one too. I'll read, I'll read one just to show a little bit about this, this notion of, of poetry is a way to, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about how poetry is an international magazine. And so I thought I'd read a poem in translation. And this poem is by a poet named Nazim Hikmet, who was uh, an early 20th century poet. He was from Turkey and he was uh, uh, a communist. And the, uh, the government found out about him uh, and his poems and his books and put him in prison. And he wrote his poems from jail, um, but they are, so unrestrained there that they, they could not he could not contain his joy. Just a really remarkable poet. So just one point by Nazim Hikmet, and then we'll finish up with now. So this is a poem called Poem. And I'm gonna I'll show you on the page. You know, you have one speaker here and one speaker here. Poem. There was a waitress at the Astoria restaurant in Berlin, a jewel of a girl. She'd smile at me over her heavy trays. She looked like the girls of the country I'd lost. Sometimes she had dark circles under her eyes. I don't know why. I never got to sit at one of her tables. He never once sat at one of my tables. He was an old man and he must have been sick. He was on a special diet. He could gaze at my face so sadly but he couldn't speak German. Three months he came in for three meals a day, then he disappeared. Maybe he went back to his country. Maybe he died before he could. Wow. So I, I just marvel at that poem, the way this connection is made between these two human beings who, who never meet. You know, I think we're all sharing common experiences and yet we don't always have a way to to bring it together in the same frame. And I love the way Hikmet has brought together these, these two characters who cared about one another uh, and were never able to express it um, in life. Uh, it's just an, an extraordinary poem. poem. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the sonnet that closes the book? I should tell a little, a little backstory. I, I, when I heard this issue was coming out, I was very excited. I said, Richard, tell me about your introduction. And he said, oh, I don't need to introduce it. It's you know, the hundredth issue, fortieth anniversary. What do I need to say? He said, "I put it all at the in the back of the book in a sonnet." 
and I was very skeptical, but then I read the sonnet. Do you mind reading it really quickly? No, I'll be happy to. It's called Sonnet from the Editor, Poetry East 1980 to 2020. I have no manifesto, no radical plan to save the world, no new philosophies, just my hand extended in friendship. The challenge is unworldly, to be awake, aware of the way each moment connects to art, to the past, and leads us to redeem language and make more songs, songs about common little things, cups of pencils, and noble songs about grief and beauty. No one has ever asked me for the solution to this hard life we are in. Why would they? And what could I say that might be of service, except that some have journeyed with me in the work of poetry, beauty, mercy, and peace. Well, you said no manifestos, but what a great manifesto. <laughs> we and, always say there's no manifesto and then there's a manifesto. That's the way it works. And what was the line from that noble songs of? Of beauty, what was it? Noble songs of beauty and grief. I don't even remember my own poem. Yeah, grief and beauty. Noble Speaking songs of noble songs of beauty. grief and beauty, we'd like to um, end, and I have a, a just a thing I want to add after it with a, a, a noble song of grief and beauty uh, now. Yeah. Uh, yes. that opens this book. And it's such a great poem for the moment we now face where we're moving into a new world because of COVID, a new presidency. Uh, the George Floyd decision yesterday feels like it's a pivot point. But anyway, I, Richard, go ahead. I totally agree. You know, this, this poem was in the very first issue of Poetry East. It's by a Swedish poet named Jorn Sonnevi and it was translated um, for the journal by Robert Bly. And I think it's as relevant then, uh, as relevant now as it was then. Um, I think it speaks to today like, like no other poem. And it's why I wanted to start the journal with this particular poem. It's called Now. Now the chance opens to another way of life. Will we take it? Will we look it squarely in the eye? I believe the opening of the chance is very narrow. It shines at the threshold of a closed door which can be opened. It can only be opened by many people together. That's such a wonderful poem. And, and one of the reasons I love that poem is it, is it gets us into the next thing we're doing at the DePaul Publishing Institute, which is, is that door opening. Um, Slagglass City, this wonderful, um, uh, urban focused uh, nonfiction magazine edited by Derry, Barry Jean Borich is doing an event on Friday, June 4th at, from noon to uh, 1.30. And the, the, this theme is, I love this, the blissful city. Uh, and it's purposely put just like that poem, Richard, at the end of the yes. pandemic, looking forward, it asks the questions, what city bliss do we miss? What joys are with us still? And I think those are questions we're really facing now. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that event. And I'm really yeah. grateful to you, Richard Jones, my dear colleague, mm. uh, and to Jennifer and to the library staff for this wonderful opportunity. What an honor to be in conversation with you. Well, the honor is mine. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Leland and Chicago Public Library. And Miles, always a pleasure to talk with you, whether it's by, by a Zoom in the hallway or going out for a beer. Always enjoy it. Well, thank you both. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to Richard Jones and Miles Harvey. Uh, there were people in the comments making suggestions and connections. So you might have some new students. Make sure uh, DePaul gives you a commission for that tuition dollars. Uh, but if you want more information about the program that they teach in, you can go to DePaul's website, depaul.edu. I want to remind you that there are many, many programs uh, that are happening virtually throughout Poetry Month, which we still have about a week to go at Chicago Public Library. So check out our website at shypublib.org for more information on all of those, as well as many other author talks, book discussions, workshops, and more. Have a great night, everybody, and happy Poetry Month.